Good afternoon, everybody. It is so great to see all of you. Thank you so much for being here for Deploy 24. Uh, I have the incredible honor of being on stage with these two remarkable CEOs. Uh, these are two leaders that have worked very closely uh, with the Department of Energy for quite a long time. Uh, they are well regarded uh, in their own companies, in the fields that they work in, uh, and certainly among those of us who work at DOE who, are, who have long admired uh, the work that they do. So we just heard from, from Campbell about sustainable aviation fuel, specifically about the liftoff effort. Uh, and we heard directly about feedstocks. And so my first question for both of these two executives is going to be specifically about waste and renewable feedstocks. You both work in this area. Can you each share some reflections about how, how you are thinking about supply chains uh, when it comes to waste and renewable feedstocks? Happy to start. Um, thank you. When I think about waste and, and using waste resources, I think about going to the waste and creating a distributed world. Today, we use 100 million barrels of petroleum every day. It is the densest liquid known to man, and it literally is taken to a central location where it is further refined and converted into all of the products we use every day. When you think about waste, whether it's municipal solid waste, whether it is uh, an industrial waste resource or biomass, it's very difficult to transport 200,000 barrel per day level capacity to a center location. And so instead, what we imagine is taking the supply chain to the waste. And, and that is exactly what we do. We work with steel mill gases. We put our refineries at the steel mill. We uh, work with CO2 and hydrogen. We go to the CO2 source. We work with gasified municipal solid waste. We go to the municipal solid waste. And so then the next thing you start to imagine is there are certain things that don't scale by replicating identical units that you would use at the waste area. Instead, they scale by making them bigger. And so when you are looking at scaling something by making it bigger, then you start to imagine a hub and spoke approach. We make ethanol. We can take ethanol from multiple distributed locations to a central refinery where that ethanol can be converted to sustainable aviation fuel, where that ethanol can be converted to polyester. So imagine going to the feedstock and then taking that converted liquid product that can move to a central location. Great. Andy. So Jeff, it's hard. Uh, my feedstock uh, plugs built the largest PEM liquid hydrogen plant in the world in Georgia. And what we need is low cost green electricity. And uh, you know, in, if you go look in Texas, where we're looking to build a 45 ton per day liquid plant, uh, we have a PPA with Nextera. And you know, that PPA is around three cents a kilowatt hour. So you can start imagining how the cost of green hydrogen can be competitive with gray hydrogen. But the future's going to be different. And I think that uh, I always like to think about Germany over the last couple of years. So in the month of May, Germany, 11% of the time, the cost of electricity was negative. Think about what the US grid will look like in 2035. And we really believe a plug, that electricity cost will be significantly lower when we need to generate hydrogen. We'll be generating hydrogen at night. The cost of our equipment, we've been on a 25% learning curve over my 15 years of plug, that'll continue. That hydrogen from a variable point of view will be like solar, almost free. And then when you think about the duck curve, and when you need electricity on the grid, there'll be products like plug stationary products, which are in early generations. I believe there's seven generations ago. We'll be using that low cost feedstock of hydrogen stored in salt caverns, which I understand met the latest 48 credit today. So we were happy about that, which will be putting electricity on the grid. And that's really our dream of the future. But as you know, Jeff, from dealing with us, we actually live the future and do real things today. 
Great. Thank you both uh, for those answers. And uh, building off of that, I know that both of you think quite a bit about your workforce uh, and about jobs and about creating economic benefit in the communities uh, in which you're operating. Can you talk a little bit about how you think, think about jobs and economic opportunity? So it's easy for me, Jeff, because uh, the kind of work we do, building hydrogen plants, uh, actually looks a lot like oil and gas, how you design and build those plants. So 30% of my workforce, professional workforce, actually comes from the oil and gas industry. So I probably have about 500 people in Houston, about 200 people in the Netherlands who did work for Shell, who've done work all around the world. We have people in India, about 150, who actually are oil and gas people. So the skill sets, and actually they have a, knowing how to build plants and to operate plants and design plants for customers, uh, that's a skill set that exists in the fossil fuel industry today and completely applicable to everything we're doing. The second item I like to bring up is we have about 500 service people in the field doing fuel cell work. In my mind, the folks we've been educating for the last 15 years, when there's fuel cell engines of the future for vehicles, these folks are going to be folks starting their own companies. They're going to be the experts. They're going to know how a fuel cell works, how to repair it, how to make it work better. They're getting all that training today. And like most folks, we work with community college, we work with uh, local universities. I think we have 30 universities we're working with. But that work with the service folks, all those oil and gas folks, they're jobs today. And that's what to me is valuable. Great. Jennifer? Yeah. That I started by saying that we are focused on distributed production as a first step, right? That means we go to where the waste is. So that means we're going to create jobs. We are creating jobs in places where there weren't jobs before. There weren't these types of industrial jobs. And, and the jobs that you're creating range from operations to engineering to design. Every level of the workforce, automation, they, they're all going to be needed. They are already needed. One of our facilities where we take ethanol to sustainable aviation fuel is in a town in Georgia where literally there were no jobs. And so we are creating jobs. We're creating jobs every day. In addition, we're not destroying jobs at the central location because all we're doing is, in my mind, when we make ethanol to make sustainable aviation fuel from waste, you know, if, if we're going to put the sustainable aviation fuel plant in a refinery, that means the ethanol is made in new locations, but the old locations need to run a new unit operation as well. So we're also augmenting jobs in the locations that already had jobs. So I, I really think one of the great things about new technologies and new economies, when you are working with an established economy, what is, what is it that they do? They want to optimize. They want to reduce cost. They want to reduce employees. If you're instead in growth mode because you're doing something new, that's when you're creating jobs. That's when you create opportunity. Great. Thank you both for those, uh, for those wonderful answers. Uh, you've probably heard quite a bit uh, just today that we tend to think about uh, private sector leadership and uh, enabled by the government, enabled by the public sector. And both of your companies uh, have been particularly effective at building relationships within the public sector and taking advantage of opportunities created by the Inflation Reduction Act. How do you think about and how do you see the future of public-private partnerships? Andy. So Jeff, uh, we're in the energy space. And if anyone ever tells you, I mean, I've, I've heard my fossil fuel friends get up and talk about they don't need subsidies. If you're in the energy space, you're in the national security space also. And uh, I think it is critical. First, uh, you know, I've worked with the DOE through President Bush, through President Obama, through President Trump, 
through President Biden, and we've always had a great relationship, and they've done wonderful things to help build the company. So I should start out by saying that. But we're also in the energy space. And we are in a, you know, competition around the world. And if, you know, hydrogen is going to be part of the future energy landscape. And the question for America, quite honestly, is do we want to be the leader? Or, quite honestly, do you want China to be the leader? I mean, I, I hate to be, because I actually have mixed feelings about competition like that, but the fact of the matter is, for our own national security, hydrogen and fuel cells need to be part of it. And I think that from working with multiple administrations, I think that message res resounds. You know, people get it. You don't want, you want to be independent. And the things we do, ultimately, you know, I mentioned when you think about what a grid's going to look like. Look, I don't care what policy is. There's going to be more renewables on the grid. Solar is lower cost than alternatives. Doesn't matter. It's going to be there. And how we leverage hydrogen in that kind of world, it's going to happen. And governments are going to care. Our government's going to care. I can tell you a lot of the work I do in Europe and Australia, they care because they recognize it needs to be part of their energy independence for the future. So I, uh, I see us continue to engage with government on things to make America stronger and, quite honestly, make liberal democracies stronger. Great. Yeah, I mean, I think public-private partnerships are very critical, and, and let me highlight a couple of <coughs> examples. At the end of the day, when you're doing something disruptive and something completely new, the risk premium of getting capital to do the scale-up work, you know, you start in the lab, you go to the pilot, then you go to a demo, then you build the first commercial, and you go to a bank and they literally laugh at you, right? You know, your risk premium of building something disruptive and new is not a risk they can take. And, and in fact, they shouldn't take it. They're, they're helping also, um, you know, they have the money of a lot of people that, that they need to protect. So I think it's a fair thing to have a high risk premium when there's a high risk. The public money then is very helpful, right? Because in a cost-shared approach, it allows you to de-risk to the next stage when the private capital can come in and help you deploy. As Jennifer Granholm likes to say, deploy, deploy, deploy. But you can't do that until you've built the first ones. And so it's absolutely critical that public funding be available to make that happen. I think the other thing that's important, and you see this in the United States, there's a lot of incentives um, for sustainable aviation fuel, for hydrogen, for green energy. Those are really important because if you're doing something disruptive and you're doing something new, the cost is more expensive. You cannot compete with a 100-year-old industry that's optimized itself over 100 years. Um, and so what you have to do is help pay for that initial green premium, is what we would call it today. And the more you build, the cheaper it gets. We've seen this with solar, right? I mean, not even 15 years ago, we were all saying solar will never get deployed. It's never going to happen because it was so expensive. And look at where we are now, right? It's competitive on a levelized cost with, with any type of fossil power. So I think the first piece is helping finance the scale up and the new technology. The second piece is helping drive demand by reducing costs through incentives that enable further deployment. These are both very, very important if you're scaling something disruptive. And I'll take a few more seconds, if I may. Okay. The other thing that I think is super important when we think about the Department of Energy in particular, who's been an amazing partner for Lancetech, is the Department of Energy Labs. That is a jewel in the crown of the DOE. It's a jewel in the crown of our country. These labs are able to do amazing things that a small company just doesn't have the infrastructure to do. When we set out to do sustainable aviation fuel, we partnered with the Department of Energy and we partnered with PNNL. They did the early stage groundbreaking work 
and then we were able to use our technology and our abilities to help scale it. And that sustainable aviation fuel plant, that 10 million gallon first in the world ethanol to SAF plant that's starting up, it's actually started up, um, is part of that development. Some of that technology came from a United States national lab. And so I cannot say enough about how the national labs are able to help develop new disruptive approaches that can be scaled. Yes, such, a, such an important reminder, and I, I find myself talking about our national labs almost on a daily basis. And, and building off of, of that response, we've got a number of folks here in the audience, many of whom uh, this is their first time engaging with the Department of Energy. Uh, both of you have been at this for, for a while. Do you have any, um, as we close out here, any words of advice or wisdom uh, for folks as they think about how to navigate the labs, navigate the federal government and, and DOE specifically? Andy? I think, Jeff, uh, you better know what you're talking about because I think Jennifer did a wonderful job talking about the capabilities of the lab. And uh, I know from working many programs and having some rejected, right? And, you know, we, we look at programs that align with our business objectives to make sure we're doing work that's valuable for PLUG, but also is valuable for the goals of the DOE. Uh, we work hard at our proposals to understand what needs to be in there for it to work. But uh, you know, people we're dealing with are smart, knowledgeable about their field, can kind of give you guidance along the way, Jeff, of, uh, if you listen about how to do it right the next time after you fail the first and maybe second time. Uh, but it's an incredible, valuable relationship for PLUG, both from manufacturing to product development. So, you know, we built based on the work of the IR, based on the work, of, I don't remember what the Obama plan was called now. It's been so many years. But uh, we started out with a seed of 500 units for fuel cells and forklift trucks and turned that into 70,000 units for people buying them commercially. And without convincing the DOE and bringing some customers along with us to the DOE, and bringing customers with you to the DOE helps. And I think that, that would be kind of my advice. Great. But listen, my advice to everybody who's young is listen because that's the thing I screwed up when I was younger. I didn't listen enough. And you got to listen, and they'll help you. Great. Yeah, I, th I think, um, first of all, you're right, Andy. You know, you've got to figure out how to create a win-win partnership, right? You need to remember that anything that anybody's going to do within the labs or within the DOE has to support the broader mission of the DOE. It isn't about what you want to do. It's about collectively how do you move things forward. And I think that's really important. I think the, the one thing that I would also say, we do a lot of work internationally. And I, I want you to think that, you know, having a project with the Department of Energy actually builds your credibility, especially in a foreign nation because people understand the type of vetting process that had to happen for you to get an award, for you to get a grant, for you to have a partnership. Because they know these people are, are exactly what you said, Andy, extremely bright. And so they know that things that are getting through the system are going to be valuable and have been vetted. And that really helps you internationally. And I think it's something that anybody starting out who wants to go and do something in a foreign country should consider that maybe partnering with the DOE will help you in a validating kind of way. Great, and that is a perfect note to end on. Andy Marsh, Dr. Jennifer Holmgren, thank you so much, both of you. Thank you, Jeff.